Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited about this event and the conversation that we're going to, to kick off very shortly. Um, but before we get underway, I'd like to introduce Vicky Treadle, the British High Commissioner to Australia. And unfortunately, Vicky couldn't join us here today. She's absolutely gutted. She was really excited to be part of this event, um, but she did share a brief message with us of how important the potential impact is from this challenge and what the opportunity is both for Australia and the UK, but more importantly, globally as well, the impact that we could have together. And so we just wanna play that short video from Vicky right now. Thank you. I'm delighted to support the new and sustainable materials challenge. Britain has been at the forefront of science and innovation for a few centuries. And in this century, it is all the more important for us to make sure that we maintain that position. And that is why exciting initiatives like this are so important. I look forward to seeing what young British and Australian startups in particular can deliver in response to this challenge. For us, as president of COP26, in this year, when we gather in Glasgow in November, it is all the more important to find those sustainable solutions for the future, the new innovation and technology that will drive and transition our economies, how we can repurpose materials and products for a longer sustainable future. This is so important, it is a collective effort, and I look forward to the results of the innovation that we will see and the examples that will come through as a result of this amazing initiative. Fantastic. Um, what a wonderful message from Vicky and we too share in that excitement. Um, but without further ado, let me introduce our two panellists. So Jose Roca. Jose is the Artistic Director of the 23rd Biennale of Sydney. It's taking place next year in March on the 12th, uh, from the 12th of March to the 13th of June. Um, Jose's work is influenced by art and nature. He has an absolute passion um, for bringing those two things together. And we're going to hear a little bit about that. So I'm not going to steal his thunder and, and share some of the things that I've heard him speak about because it is really, really exciting. Um, but he's got a really strong focus that he's bringing both to the, the, the artistic expression of the Biennale, but also the production of it next year. So welcome, Jose. It's fantastic to have you here. Thanks for having us. And uh, my second guest today, I'm really thrilled to introduce you to Graciela um, Miletsko Thornton. Graciela is a sustainability and climate change professional. She has over 20 years experience in the sector. She is the creative green consultancy program lead at Julie's Bicycle. Now, if you haven't checked out Julie's Bicycle, you should definitely go online and have a, have a quick Google and see about it. Um, they're a pioneering not-for-profit that actually is mobilizing the arts and culture industry and entire sector to take action in climate and, and in the climate and ecological crisis, not just through their message and what they're doing and the voices they're bringing, but also through the methods and how they actually think. And she's just got a wealth of experience and knowledge and is also at the forefront of sort of seeing what is emerging in this space. So welcome, Graziella. Yeah, thank you very much for your kind introduction, Sally. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you today. Thank you. I'm so excited to kick off the conversation shortly. But what we want to do right now is just hand over to you, um, Jose. I know you've got a vision and a passion that you want to share with us. Um, we'd love to hear from you. I know you've got a short presentation for us to talk more about the Biennale and, and your vision. So take it away. Thank you. OK. So the Biennale next year, um, it's called Rivus. Rivus is the Latin root for a brook or a stream, but also it gave uh, birth to other words like rivalis, which uh, gave birth to rivalry. So this idea of uh, water and conflict, river and contestation is at the heart of our project. Uh, but it's not just about rivers. Um, as we have progressed in the, in the research process, we have come across 
many issues that uh, preoccupy us. So things related to, for example, the rights of nature, which leads to what is the voice of nature? What is the voice of a river? How can we listen to it? How can it enter a dialogue with participants in a Biennale? But also indigenous um, stories of creation and indigenous caring for country and uh, uh, their, their living with the resources and so on and so forth. So even though the Biennale has the title Rivus, which suggests the river, uh, it'll look more like the Delta than the source. So we will be uh, um, clustering the works of the participants and I say participants and not artists because many of them are not. Many of them are architects, designers, uh, people from communities and as I said, rivers. We will be clustering them in different conceptual territories that we are calling wetlands. But that's the what of the Biennale. But we should also talk about the how. And uh, I, I read a, a quote recently by, uh, I think it was Mauricio Catalan who said that exhibitions are like sausages. They are great, but you don't want to know how they are made. Well, this is, I think this is not true. I think it, we should look uh, and try to show how exhibitions are made. Uh, I think uh, it's important to be transparent on how we put together things. So in other terms, you cannot talk about sustainability and not be sustainable, or at least try to be sustainable and be transparent on the measures you are taking to become sustainable. So I'm gonna talk about uh, the process uh, of putting together this exhibition and then about the exhibition proper and how we, are, we have taken measures to lower our impact. So process, the, our mantra is use what's already in place. Not try to invent the wheel, try to see what is already there and try to build upon that. So I decided to, to be as local as possible. So I decided to move to Sydney for the entire duration of the process as a way to show my total commitment, but also to minimize air travel, to be here in place working with my colleagues. I chose to work with a group of local curators and together we have covered much ground without uh, the need of traveling because as I've said uh, in many occasions, I see art as a long-term conversation. So um, I, there are artists that I've worked with for many, many years and this is the opportunity to continue that conversation and uh, when you uh, curate collectively, then you are continuing someone else's conversations. We are also uh, speaking to our colleagues around the world that are pointing us to interesting practices. As I said, build upon what's already there. And then in some cases, granting continuity to projects that were started in the past edition of the Biennale and that uh, merit uh, some kind of um, yeah, continuity to see uh, if they can attain their, their full potential. And then we are working with many, many partners in, in across the board, exhibition partners, but also uh, exhibition partners in other parts of Australia, which whom we are co-producing co -producing some pieces that will be shown at the Biennale and then uh, at their, at their uh, institutions thus expanding the action of the Biennale uh, beyond the time of the Biennale and beyond Sydney. So in the exhibition, we have several strategies to reduce impact. Well, as I said, reduce our travel, try to produce locally or reproduce whenever the artists let us, so as to reduce freight. We will try to reduce uh, our, uh, uh, our carbon footprint. And this is an exhibition that uh, I did three years ago where we calculated the, the um, total uh, carbon footprint of the exhibition and we communicated it to the public. We also had a label for each work where the visitor could see uh, how we reduced its impact by producing locally, as opposed to having the work shipped from its place of origin. So uh, once the exhibition is done also, how do we do the dispersal? How we recycle, repurpose or donate locally? 
In terms of uh, the exhibition design, we are striving to have the minimal museographic intervention, which means try not to paint, try to use the spaces as they come, try not to build, try to build, uh, uh, to, to take advantage of the spaces as they are, use any existing partition. If built, then soft, something that can be reused later and try not to oppose. A river never uh, uh, runs uphill. So uh, at the Biennale, we are keen of, you know, trying to go with the flow as a uh, river does. So uh, we are also encouraging the artists to use sustainable and not polluting materials and processes. And one thing that I think is important, um, which is that the materials can in themselves become uh, projects and thus part of the Biennale. So it's not, the materials are the infrastructure for the Biennale and then the Biennale is the art, no. The materials can also be part of the Biennale, an integral part, and be celebrated. So, for example, uh, as, as a material that is a project, this is Diana Scherer, who works out of Amsterdam, creating this process where she coaxes the roots of grasses to grow in particular patterns. And she creates this beautiful textile that where the root uh, weaves itself. And it is not only new carbon neutral, but it's a carbon sink as well. So it fulfills a dual purpose. So we are inviting Diana uh, to show her textiles um, at the Biennale. But this is uh, more akin to uh, an art project, but we also want to showcase what is not, not, not normally seen. So if you go to an exhibition, you don't look at the paint, you don't look at the drywall, you don't look at the plywood, which is the infrastructure that enables you to see what you are actually looking at. So we would like to address those materials. We would like to celebrate uh, new ways of dealing with the exhibition materials. And this is the reason that we are so excited about this participation. So I'll end there. Many thanks. Thank you so much, um, Jose. That was a fantastic, um, fantastic presentation. And I'm sure everybody agrees with me. Seeing the inspiration and the commitment, I think is just phenomenal. I really loved it. You said um, there's a phrase that you used as art as a long-term conversation. And I think that's a really powerful one. And I think it actually echoes scientific principles. So scientific principles and the, the, the pathway to discovery is a long-term conversation as well. So we have so much in common with art meets science. And, and, I, and I really love that. Um, I wanna come to you for my first question because you have sort of shared a little bit about your passion for um, sustainability and, and you know, your connection to nature and, and river is, is, is part of what's running through this exhibition. Um, in light of that kind of long-term conversation, how have you seen that conversation change? And, you know, what, what is, where do you see that conversation going to um, around sustainability and art and weaving that through? Is that something globally that you're seeing an increase of? I'd, I'd love to just get a little bit of insight from you. Well, I do think that uh, the last Biennale that I participated in was the Mercosur Biennale 10 years ago in, in the south of Brazil in Porto Alegre. And uh, the theme was the notion of nation, uh, uh, but we didn't really think about how we were putting together the, the show in these terms. We were trying also to, to have a, an innovative approach to it, but just, you know, it wasn't in our agenda, at least, uh, uh, the sustainability issue. And uh, let's say the, the um, the, the urgency with climate change wasn't as felt in 2010, 11, as it is now. So I think that uh, what we are experiencing, because COVID is nothing different than the earth speaking, mm -hmm. uh, uh, what we are experiencing now is that we cannot continue uh, the way we were doing things. And that has in a way ushered the set of questions that we need to address whether we like it or not. Some of us might have been 
uh, uh, talking about that for a little longer, but I think no one nowadays can ignore that those questions are there. Mm, yeah, I think you're right. And I think um, it's such an interesting thing to see how conversations are, are, are growing from you know, the, the expression of the conversation through art to actually the fullness of the experience and going down you know, the entire expression of every participant um, in that process. Um, Graziella, I want to throw to you um, because you've been doing, you've been working in this space for, you know, a really long time. You've got lots of experience and, and Julie's Bicycle, your role there, you, you know, you're really driving a lot of this conversation and change with a whole bunch of communities, not just in the UK, but beyond um, and globally. Can you tell us a little bit about some of the work that you're doing um, and, and sort of, I guess, maybe some of the solutions or the, the things that you're seeing that, that kind of, you know, are carrying this conversation forward. Yeah, thanks Sally. Yes, this is a very important year because it's the year of the COP uh, where all the countries internationally are reviewing their commitments and this is cascading in, into national policies as well. So one of the things we are doing this year is connecting the cultural policy conversation with the climate change policy conversation. This is in partnership with the British Council. So we are organizing a number of roundtables. We are engaging in all regions uh, globally. Uh, we are also doing research about what cultural policy is doing about climate change. And uh, one important element is that we see this as an ecosystem, an ecosystem of relationships between artists, between organizations, designers, policy, and cities. And we focus on those relationships. Uh, an example is uh, our program with Arts Council England, for instance. Uh, all uh, funding that goes through Arts Council England to 800 organizations. The organizations annually report on their environmental impacts, their environmental policies, their action plans, plans through a platform that we have at Julie's Bicycle. Uh, and every year we also review all that content and we publish a report which is available in our website. I really want to encourage you to have a look. But uh, we see improvements. We, we see really that this, this gives results. And for instance, it's in four years between tw uh, 2013 and 2017, we've seen a reduction of 23% of energy consumption. That means uh, because the UK is decarbonizing the grid, we see a 35% decrease in energy emissions. Uh, we see that 78% of the organizations have included environmental sustainability in their core business strategy. That's a, that's a really key element. 38% of the organizations have director or board level representatives with a specific environmental remit. And then around Half uh, of the organizations are trialing sustainable production or exhibition methods. So that's, that's really about driving innovation, peer learning, uh, synergies, communicating. So we, we try always to, be, to emphasize communication of, of all these learnings. So this inspires other organizations as well. Those statistics are phenomenal, right? They are really, really impressive. And, and I love, um, there's a couple of things I think that are really striking about what you just said. Um, one is that it's a commitment and a collaboration between government, between the arts sector and the community, between organisations, between Julie's Bicycle. So it is a collaboration. We know that change doesn't come from just, you know, one person alone. One person can, can inspire change, but we actually collectively have to come together and do it. And that's incredibly impressive. I think the other thing that um, really excites me about that is that, you know, people are actually embedding that vision and those values into the practice and the organization and the leadership. It's, it's really phenomenal work um, that you're doing and really inspiring, I think, for, for us to hear about it here, for those of you, of you who are watching today that haven't heard about it before. Um, I've got a question for both of you, um, and this is gonna probably take from the, the high level sort of vision and, and policy piece and what we can do to, to drive change, but giving us a little bit of maybe an insight of under the hood of some of the things that maybe you're seeing. Um, 
this last year, I think we've we've had a shared experience of human as humans that we haven't had for quite some time, or not in my living memory, um, you know. But the pandemic has actually kind of caused a really um, a unique opportunity where emotionally we've had similar challenges, physically we've had similar challenges. You know, we are kind of united in that shared experience. And one of the things that's done for us here at Cicada, and certainly um, I think a lot of our colleagues around the world, is to really rethink not just how we um, are thinking about health and well-being, but actually how we're thinking about the building blocks of life, you know, how we're thinking about our homes and the environment, what can we do differently and why, how, how do we rebuild things and rebuild better? Um, because we don't want to go back to normal. We do want to be different. And Jose, you sort of mentioned this about, you know, you've come here and committed so that you're reducing your carbon footprint by not flying. Um, yeah. What are some of the things that you've seen, um, and, and I'll throw to either one of you that wants to jump into this, what have you seen that's been emerging in a physical sense of a new product or um, a new opportunity and from anywhere in the world in this sector that kind of gets you excited that we think we need to be adopting more of that? Maybe I'll let Graciela answer. Yeah, we, we are seeing a very significant transformations. Organizations, uh, are rethinking what they are doing, looking at what they've done in the past and what what they want to do differently in the in the future. So, in the area of materials, so I think mycelium is particularly yeah the star of the sector because there's been enough experimentation and innovation now. I was just mentioning to Sally that uh, I was meeting a colleague from Rioja in Spain a couple of weeks ago. And he said, you know Rioja by the wine, but you are now going to know Rioja about the mushrooms because we, we are uh, uh, really growing mushrooms and we are looking at industrial symbiosis and how are we going to really experiment with mushrooms differently. We have one organization in the UK that are looking at ex extending and refurbishing, also doing experimentation uh, with mycelium really, uh, with the grass cuttings as, as Jose was showing before for really. So instead of manufacturing, we are thinking about growing materials. Well, what a fantastic idea is that really, thinking growing materials and, and using the, the, the abundance of resources in a, in a different way really, using different resources, replacing monocultures mono, yeah, um, of cultivation. Uh, another area where we see a lot of uh, transformation is in digitalization. Also, this digitalization to check condition of pieces of art. So you don't need a courier. You can check that virtually uh, through all communications. Uh, transport companies are looking at reorganizing their traveling, looking more carefully sharing couriers as well, uh, reusable crates as well that can be adaptable. So there is quite a lot of innovation. We publish a lot of, we, we did our own introspection uh, period as well last year, and we published, uh, we did research with the support of the AKO Foundation around the carbon impact of the um, visual arts sector. We look at it globally. We build a model about uh, the carbon impact of the visual arts sector. And we also look at innovation. And th that report is called The Art of Zero. So that's, that's available on our website too. And we highlighted all, all this innovation. But we also found out in our model that the, the art sector produces around 12 million tons of CO2 annually. So what does it mean? It means that we will have to build 1,500 um, 10 megawatts wind turbines per year. And, and that's, that's not possible. And we, and we didn't count visitor travel uh, in there. So if, you, if you count visitor travel, it's around probably 60 million. But this is a model and, um, and we can change models. That's, that's, the, that's, that's, that's the thing that we need to look, yeah, what we, what we go in front into the future now, really. Right. And uh, our Biennale uh, is probably one of the first large events to have been conceived within COVID because there, there were many Biennales and events that were supposed to open 
and then they have been sort of moved and they had to adapt. Uh, but ours was conceived within COVID. So we knew that was there and that we have to cope with it. So I think what we have all learned in, in this uh, year and a half, almost three years, um, is that uh, there are, it's, it is possible to do things uh, differently. You don't have to canvas the world to find interesting practices. You can rely on your colleagues, for example. Um, there, you, there, are, uh, there is no substitute for the direct experience of the work. That's my opinion. But many parts of the process can be done remotely. And I think that is something that should uh, really uh, remain as a result of all these changes that we have been forced to do uh, because of COVID. So there are, there are things there that are forced by necessity that can remain once uh, that necessity is no longer there. I, um, I really love that point. I think um, it, it's kind of, it, it relates to a, a term that we used often in engineering about a forcing function. COVID has forced us to rethink and reevaluate and relook at things. And so that remaining of what can remain and how can we take it forward, I think is, is a really powerful one. Um, I just want to remind everybody that's watching to, you know, drop your questions into the Q&A function because we will come to those fairly soon. I've got a couple more questions though for Graziella and, and Jose before we come to the Q&A. Um, so Graziella, you've been mentioning a whole bunch of initiatives and resources and tools. Um, what are some, are you, and you've kind of touched on a couple of the, the biggest challenges and identified, but what's some of the actions that, you know, anybody that's watching this today that might be involved with an organisation, what's some of the actions that they can take? Is there a resource that we can point them to or something that they should be thinking about to take their first steps on this journey if they haven't done that already? Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, yeah, when we start, we always look at how we consume energy, what materials do we use, the way of consuming water, the amount of waste, those, those are the areas that we look at it for as a starting point. But for me, I think the most important thing that we learn is time. <laughs> it's a starting look at that early, at an early stage of your processes of what you are planning to do. Because incorporating sustainability at the last minute, really, it is quite difficult. It may not be more expensive, definitely. Many, many people think, so no, sustainability is very expensive. No, actually, if you reuse all your materials and you spend more in people than materials, it's, gonna, uh, it's actually going to be cheaper. So we have shown that in, in many situations, for instance, in, in theater production, if one person is being contracted at the very beginning and, and starts re, um, looking for materials that are already there instead of building from new, you are going to save money. So, but time is, is really essential and, and a process going through, a, through the whole process, the, the transformation of process uh, along all, the, all your pathway as well. Flexibility, I would say, is the other element. If you go, if you go very fixed ideas about, and this is something we see a lot in the visual arts sector, no, I want this wall in this position or I want this exact color. Uh, so I was fascinated that Jose said no painting. I wanna, <laughs> I know always able to say this really when we're working with visual arts organizations because I know we are gonna get a, a little bit of resistance from the start. Uh, but yeah, so I think abandoning perfection is is one important element for the visual arts that likes a lot all these. Uh, straight surfaces, perfection, uh, everything needs to look really completely perfect. And uh, so I think uh, it's, it's a change in mindset, really. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, uh, from the very beginning. I feel like you've just like 
reiterated um, exactly how Jose talked about the the plan for the Biennale. Um, there was so much of that echoed in what he's already shared with us. And I feel like you've conspired together before this to, <laughs> to collude, to be on the same page. It's it's amazing. But also, if I think about, you know, um, Jose, you said this earlier about the river and the river, you know, makes its own way. You can't necessarily tell it where to go. And that's, you know, that's that flexibility that you're talking about, Graziella. It's, it's, it's quite incredible to you both talking about you know one um, how everyone can think about it Graziella but Jose how you've actually been doing that process and thinking it through um I, I before we come to the questions and I am going to come to them in a second because we've got a couple coming through that I think are really interesting um I want to I want to kind of think if we're going to go out to the science and the new materials community and the community that maybe is building things and using them and thinking about completely different sectors, they're complete thinking about the housing sector or commercial sector or things like that. What's your plea? And, and this is to both of you. What's your plea to the science and technology community of, of what you would love to see from us? How can we um, engage in this sector and, and understand the challenges that you're facing and, and think about it? Because I do think it is a, a coming together that's really needed. And um, and, and, and a collaboration that's really needed. But, but what would be your plea to be the science and technology people helping, helping and supporting the, the arts community and industry becoming sustainable? Yeah, I think it needs, you can start by yourself, of course, but then you are in a society, which means that there are structural changes that need to happen for your own changes to, to, to gather some momentum. So you can, for example, and this you, you were mentioning, uh, can we not paint the walls? Uh, can we not build new walls? Well, we can uh, if we are um, working on our own you know, premises. But what about when you're working with, a, with an exhibition partner that has their own uh, way of doing things and won't, even if it's saving money, won't let you not paint, won't let you not build or just reuse whatever is already there because there is uh, their, their own way of doing things. And uh, so I think it's important to understand that it has to be systemic to a certain extent. So my, my plea would be, you know, that, that uh, make for for the, high, the bigger structures to make it easier for those who want to do things otherwise. Graziella, have you got anything to add? Plea to the scientists and engineers. No, definitely we need more research in in very specific areas. Really, one of the there is an increased awareness and there is an increased commitment. But then when people start doing these things, they find out, oh, where do I get glue that is not toxic? Where can I actually play with materials? Uh, what can I do in terms of digitalizing this process? I haven't got the knowledge. So we definitely need more partnerships, uh, with more research and investment that link to the arts and the cultural sector and the creative sector. And there is a huge amount of creativity that can also feed back into the science and research sector uh, as well. And, and an element that I haven't mentioned, but we work also, is part of our framework, is, is environmental justice. So we need that globally. We need to make sure that we're not leaving anybody behind. And, and, and this all cascades and, and also brings creativity of, of, other, of other areas, no? like Africa, Latin America, the regions in Asia, that, that we maybe are, are uh, not no part of the conversation, but they are doing lots of things where, that where we can learn from each other as well. So more connectivity, actually. And we haven't got any excuse. Look, look at uh, uh, our IT systems, really. So no excuse now. We know instantly what's happening in other parts of the world. I, I love that. Uh, I would add to my, to my answer uh, that uh, the plea would be for those that are interested that have uh, new materials to propose to participate in this, uh, because otherwise we won't be able to know what they are doing. And so many times we, we sort of criticize something 
but the best way to, to address uh, critique is to provide alternatives. So maybe if the, uh, whoever has a better way of doing things comes forward, participates in this challenge, we will be able to do things differently. I love that. Um, you're both speaking to my heart and to, to our core mission here, which is collaboration and bringing people together and the diversity of backgrounds and experience and perspectives um, to participate. And, and I actually, I'm gonna try and use your word participants um, in this because it is a participation. I may not be the one that brings something beautiful to life in terms of the creative um, artwork, uh, but I could participate in potentially being the building blocks behind that that holds it up or what that what it's actually used. And I think that that collaboration and that connection and that conversation is something we're really excited about. And speaking of conversations, I do want to ask a couple of questions from the audience um, to, to you because I think this it's a really great engagement. People are actually really excited about this. They're really excited about the vision and the passion and the commitment that you both have. Um, one of our one of our questions that's come through is a big thank Thank you to you, both um, Jose and Graciela. With regards to installations or large scale exhibitions, we still throw out a fair amount of exhibition installation materials. Is there any advice or strat on strategies to engage others to reduce this? Um, apart from if you're in construction or you've got a new materials to help with this, apply for the challenge. So aside from that, what, um, what are some of the, the possible pathways for this? Well, I think that we have been doing that uh, whenever we meet with an artist or, an, or a participant, we encourage them to think of ways of uh, participating in the Biennale without shipping things. Sometimes this is not possible. A drawing is a drawing, but sometimes a drawing can be reproduced locally, digitally, and it's okay. Uh, sometimes we place too much uh, importance on, on the aura of the original, but there are other ways to do things. Um, so I would say uh, um, trying to address these problems from the very uh, beginning so that uh, the exhibition happens. I mean, when the exhibition happens, then you start thinking, what are you going to do with the materials? No, it should be thought integrally from the very beginning so you know what you're going to get. And uh, addressing the, the previous point of w when you want to do good, but the system doesn't let you. Sometimes you want to recycle materials, but the system doesn't let you do that for some you know, regulation. So this needs to, to be addressed from the very inception of the process. Otherwise, it won't happen. Graciela, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, so I would I would turn the question around. Why uh, you can't? Why are you producing so much waste? At what point in the process you made a decision that that waste is going to exist? So reverse the whole process. And uh, sometimes with very formalized organizations, you may need to make these systematic in contracts also so we are working with an exhibition where we are translating all this into contract elements all mm -hmm. along the way when when you hire a designer when you build the exhibition with the constructors when you the commission and so that's going to make you aware in all those steps where you can reduce and the other element is a good opportunity to open conversations within organizations because I know that many, many designers get very frustrated because they say, well, we want to do this differently. We want to do modular uh, exhibitions and that the organization can reuse it in the next one. But exhibitions are not planned in a coordinated way in an organization. Well, the first step is breaking those conversations. In the first year, things may not change, but in year two and three, uh, this definitely going to be a change yeah fantastic um Jose I just want to come back to you because you mentioned um with working with your participants and looking at them have many of them had to adopt their practices or the use of their primary materials or have you actually sourced people that have already thinking sustainably what's what's been sort of the give and take between that for for the for the biennale in, in next year I think a little of both um so we 
there is a reality beyond, um, say, thinking about sustainability, which is we are in Australia and nobody can come in. That means that uh, if we were to invite someone to produce their work here, uh, we might not be able to. So even if we want to have the artists here uh, and not ship the work, we have a problem. So we have been, we have several scenarios with each one of the participants. One, the person comes here and does a project here and we can control how the project is produced, how we'll, we'll deal with waste if there, if any, etc. The second is the uh, person cannot come, uh, but can give us instructions and we can do it here. And the third is when unavoidable, then the work gets shipped. And in those cases, we try to have several scenarios so that we are not spending so much uh, money and, uh, and, and carbon footprint in bringing those works here. Um, we've got probably time for one more question because we are coming up to time, but I'm actually going to combine um, two, to, to, two together because it talks about um, the idea of an accessible audit or presentation of the process, you know, what's the, the cost and the carbon footprint and is there a green star rating that can be applied to contemporary exhibitions? I think you've both talked about this a little bit, you know, Jose, you talked about um, the, 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 the demonstration that you had in a previous exhibition where it talked about what the carbon footprint and things were like that. So um, maybe I'll start with you and ask the question of, you know, what does that look like for the Biennale next year? How do you think you're going to talk about what the carbon footprint is or what the environmental impact is and what you're doing. Um, and then Graziella, we might come to you and talk about, I know you've got some tools and, and, and things that people could also apply. So maybe starting with you, Jose, what your plan is for the, the Biennale or what you can share. Yeah, well, uh, I started out uh, thinking that we should uh, not print anything if we can uh, help it. So because many of the exhibition ephemera gets just thrown away after you, like, like for example, those uh, pieces of paper with the labels of a given show or a small, um, like a brochure, etc. So I said, we won't have that. And we won't have a catalog, for example. Uh, instead of that, we are planning to have a more uh, substantial book that will read uh, as a sort of a reader, a companion to the exhibition, because nowadays it's very easy to find information online. So you don't really need to have that. But in terms of the exhibition itself, I had this idea that maybe with uh, image recognition or a QR code, you could just uh, have the labels right there and other content. But I, I visited several um, exhibitions and institutions that do that. And I was dismayed uh, at uh, seeing people looking at their phones all the time and not at the art. So I think we're gonna meet you know, the problem halfway. We're gonna have the basic information and we're gonna have a QR code that in Australia at least is mandatory everywhere. You know, it's, uh, if you want to enter anywhere you have to scan a QR code. So it's not you know, um, elitist or anything. And that QR code will take you to, for example, the carbon footprint calculation of that particular word, work when uh, relevant or some other um, content that you, that, that it's more, less textual and more visual or um, auditive that will complement your experience. That's, uh, but we are currently discussing this with the team. We don't have a, an answer yet. It's a good conversation to have. And, and you know, maybe Graziella, if you share with us, you know, your approach to this and some of your tools and tips and tricks, it might give us all a bit of a few, few ideas might spark as well. <laughs> yeah, in terms of calculating carbon footprint, we have an online calculator that we, we developed for the art sector uh, for all different partners in the art sector. So we, we work with theater, music, events, visual arts. So that's, that's a free tool that anybody can use. 
Um, but when you are just starting, I would say uh, the most important thing is to map your processes as, as we were talking about and look in, in which stage of your, of your process you are producing your main environmental impacts, which is probably a design stage really. And in terms of resources, we have a wide variety of resources online. Uh, definitely look at the arts of zero for the visual arts sector, but also we look at the synergies with other sectors. So uh, we recently produced um, a research publication about the impacts of digital as well, because the, uh, being digital has an impact as well, and there are some ways of, of reducing that impact as well. Uh, so, um, yeah, I would say, yeah, those, those are the main tools, yeah that we provide. That's um, absolutely fantastic. I hate to call it end to this conversation because I think we could go on for hours, but um, but it is time to, to wrap up. And I just want to say a massive thank you to both of you um, today for your insights. Um, actually, even more for your vision. I think it's really uh, incredible, the commitment that you both have um, to the work that you do and that you're carrying on the conversation, not just as a conversation, but also putting it into practice. Because words without action, you know, really are clanging bells and not necessarily useful. And so words and actions and words and deeds when they line up really are powerful ways of driving change. And I think the fact that you're both so committed to bringing people into that community and into that conversation to go on the journey together is really, really inspiring. And we're certainly excited to be on the journey with you. So I do do want to thank you both so much. Um, I just want to, you know, thank and acknowledge our partners um, in the challenge, uh, the Biennale of Sydney. Um, if it wasn't for you and the conversations that we've had, we wouldn't be here today. The UK Australia Seasons, the collaboration between the British Council and the Australian go uh, Government's Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and the UK Government's Science and Innovation Network. Um, I, I'm really excited to work with such strong partners and collaborators to actually try and lean into this conversation and this commitment that you both have, but um, that you're leading uh, with the Biennale, Jose. Um, so for all of you out there who are watching today, I know that there's been lots of people engaging on the chat and lots of people asking questions online. We will be sharing with you after this event, um, probably tomorrow for us now, um, but we will be sharing out uh, a video recording. It will be available and we'd love it if you could, our passionate plea to everybody watching this right now, um, that you would go away from this conversation inspired, that you would go away from this conversation convicted, um, and most importantly, that you would go away from this conversation wanting to contribute. And there's a couple of ways we wanna call for you to contribute. We want you to share this challenge and this opportunity and share it far and wide. We want solutions. We want people to put in the ideas, the new materials, the solutions that they're thinking about and, and find out um, how they could be participants in the Biennale as well, because that is the opportunity on the line here um, to be part of that um, if, you're, if you're successful. We want you to share that word. We want you to go away though too, not just about the Biennale, but go away and look at your own workplace, your own community and your own family and think, what could I do differently here? And how might I think bit differently about the future that I'm building for my family, my community and my workplace. Because I think there's, um, to, to both Jose and, and Graziella's point, if we start that conversation early, before we start building the future, we actually build into that sustainability and that mindset in along the way. So please do that as well. Um, so we are at the end of our time. Um, it is Sad to say goodbye, but thank you so much for joining us and we look forward to continuing the journey and um, seeing what gets unearthed with this challenge and how it, it, it goes uh, forward and becomes part of the Biennale and part of maybe even seasons and beyond. Be fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Many thanks. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs>